The Star is My Destination by Alfred Bester. Stranded and Betrayed In the year 2257, Gulliver Foyle, marooned and the sole survivor aboard the derelict spaceship Nomad, drifted aimlessly in the vast, silent expanse of space. The tool locker he inhabited was a frigid, dimly lit coffin. The metal walls chilling to the touch and so narrow he could feel the cold embrace of the void just inches away. His breath, shallow and visible in the meager light, were a rhythmic reminder of the oxygen tanks he so precariously depended on, each breath a victory over the suffocating emptiness. Oxygen's dwindling, he whispered hoarsely, his voice barely audible over the hum of the life support systems. The oppressive silence of space weighed heavily upon him, a constant companion in his solitary confinement. Boyle's daily existence was monotonous. Monitor the oxygen, carefully divide the remaining rations, and nurture the flickering flame of hope for rescue. That flame was extinguished the day the Vorga T, 1339, callously sailed past, ignoring his frantic signals, his desperate Theoes lost in the abyss. Why? He bellowed into the vacuum, his plea for mercy unheard. Why have you forsaken me? The cold indifference of the passing ship ignited a fire within him. He was no longer the man resigned to a fate of waiting. He was transformed into an avatar of retribution. With a newfound determination, he began to master the remnants of the Nomad, setting his sights on Jupiter, the colossal beacon that represented his slim chance at survival. Days merged into a singular blur, each indistinguishable from the last save for Foyle's dogged efforts to resurrect the ship's dormant engines. Come on, you obstinate relic, he urged, his voice gruff as he grappled with the unyielding controls. His hands, scarred and battered, were relentless in their task, breathing life into the inert machinery. Then, in a moment of daring innovation, he concocted a volatile mixture of sodium and water. The sodium, a soft silvery metal, reacted violently with the water, releasing hydrogen gas and generating intense heat, enough to spark the fuel into action. The ship shuddered to life, its frame groaning in protest. I've done it, Foyle cried out, his face alight with a fleeting grin of triumph. But the celebration was brief. A violent tremor rocked the vessel, flinging him against the wall, his body pinned beneath a cascade of debris. Agony ripped through him, and the edges of his vision began to darken. Yet, even as consciousness faded, his thoughts seared with images of the Vorga T. Thirteen thirty-nine, the ship that had abandoned him to his fate, the ship he vowed to seek out and exact vengeance upon. I will endure, he murmured, a solemn vow to himself, to the cosmos and they will rue the day they left Gulliver Foyle adrift. Explosive Pursuit Foyle's breaths came in ragged gasps as he clung to the wreckage of the Nomad. His mind, a whirlwind of desperation and vengeance, was singularly focused on one thing, survival. The ship Vorga had left him to die in the void of space, and now he would do anything to live and seek retribution. Gotta keep moving, he muttered to himself, his voice barely audible in the vacuum of space. With a grunt, he pushed off the debris, propelling himself towards the ship's control bridge. His movements were sluggish, his body protesting the lack of oxygen, but his will was unbreakable. Foyle's ingenuity had served him well in the past, and it was his resourcefulness that had brought him to the Sargasso asteroid, a celestial body composed of natural rock and the remnants of countless spaceships. This asteroid, home to the descendants of a marooned research team, had become a microcosm of survival and adaptation, where the scientific people thrived in the relics of space travel. As he floated through the corridors, Foyle's thoughts were not on propulsion methods, which had been exhaustively detailed before, but on survival and the task at hand. He needed to see if he was on course for Jupiter or if his fate was to drift endlessly in space. 
When he awoke from the impact of floating debris, the Sargasso asteroid loomed before him. Among its inhabitants was Moira, whose scream upon seeing foil was not just fear, but recognition of the chaos he brought with him, a chaos that threatened their precarious existence. Quiet, Foyle barked, binding her hands. There's going to be a launch, and you don't want to be here when it happens. He dragged her to the makeshift launch pad, where the Nomad's jets, now part of the asteroid's amalgam, awaited. With a final act of defiance, he ignited the jets. The explosion, contained and directed, freed the Nomad and sent it hurtling into space, with foil shielded by the very structure of the asteroid that had once imprisoned him. Annoia. Foyle's journey had taken a new turn, not with rescue, but with a relentless pursuit fueled by vengeance. The betrayals that awaited him in the vast emptiness of space were mere backdrops to his undeterred mission. His encounter with Moira and the Sargasso asteroid had been a crucible, forging a path that he would follow without falter. Harrowing Escapes Gulliver Foyle crouched in the pitch-black corridor of Goofer Martel, the darkness a suffocating cloak. The distant echoes of guards shouting and their footsteps in pursuit were the only sounds in the oppressive gloom. Jis, he whispered into the whisper line. I'm at the junction. Which way? Left, Gully. Then straight until you feel the draft from the river. Just Bella McQueen's voice crackled back. Foyle moved swiftly, his hands skimming the walls for guidance, every turn and dead end etched into his mind by Gisbella's careful instruction. You're doing great, Gisbella encouraged. Just a bit further. He pressed on, the sound of water growing louder, a rushing torrent that promised freedom. He reached the bank, the river's icy touch sending shivers up his spine. Jess... I'm there, Foyle said. You can do this, Gully, Gisbella replied. Remember, dive deep and follow the current. It'll lead you out. Foyle took a deep breath and plunged into the river. He kicked hard, propelling himself forward, driven by the thought of the light beyond the caverns. His head broke the surface and he gasped, the sweet fresh air a stark contrast to the frigid waters. The faint glow of dawn filtered through the trees, painting the world in hues of gold and green. He was free. Foyle dragged himself onto the bank, his body aching but his spirit soaring. He had escaped the inescapable, defied the darkness. And though the path ahead was fraught with danger and uncertainty, Gulliver Foyle was no longer a man to be trifled with. His odyssey of vengeance had only just begun. Mark of the Tiger Gulliver Foyle, now marked with the fierce tiger tattoo, stood before the mirror in the dimly lit room. The tattoo, a symbol of his burning vengeance, seemed to come alive with every pulse of his racing heart. Just bellow, why did you do it? He asked, his voice barely a whisper, as he turned to face his once trusted ally. Gully, you've become a monster in your quest. Chisbella replied, her eyes reflecting a mix of pity and disgust. Foyle turned back to the mirror, studying the lines of the tattoo that now defined him. I'll use this mark to strike fear into the hearts of my enemies. They abandoned me, left me to die, and now they'll see what their betrayal has created, he said with determination. As Foyle left the room, his silhouette merged with the shadows, the mark of the tiger a stark contrast against his skin. He was no longer just Gulliver Foyle, he was a force of nature, driven by revenge. The streets outside were bustling with activity, but Foyle moved unseen, a ghost among the living. His new appearance was a declaration of war against a society that had cast him aside. High Society in Betrayals In the grandeur of high society's gatherings, Gulliver Foyle, now unrecognizable after his transformative surgery, navigated the elite's world with a newfound grace. The tiger tattoo, once a symbol of his lower status, had been masterfully concealed by the pristine surgeons, 
allowing him to mingle undetected among the affluent. His mission was clear, to seek retribution against the Vorga's crew for their betrayal. Boyle's education in the ways of the elite had been thorough, courtesy of the Prestain family. They had taken him under their wing, refining his speech, attire, and manners to match his elevated ambitions. It was a meticulous process, but Foyle proved to be an astute pupil, absorbing the nuances of high society with a keen eye for detail. His transformation was not merely physical. He had learned to temper his emotions, to prevent any hint of his past from surfacing. As he stood silently at Robin Wensbury's side, his brooding presence piqued the curiosity of the assembled guests. Robin, with her natural social flair, engaged the crowd with captivating tales, while Foyle observed, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. When confronted by a disdainful aristocrat about his identity, Foyle responded with a veiled threat, his voice carrying the weight of his resolve. The man, sensing the danger, quickly offered up the information Foyle sought. With each revelation, Foyle's list of targets grew, bringing him closer to the vengeance that fueled his ascent into this world of privilege. Yet, as the evening progressed, the lines between hunter and hunted blurred, with the high society's deceptive nature threatening to ensnare them both in a web of intrigue and betrayal. Foyle's quest for justice had led him here, but the path forward was fraught with peril, not just for his prey, but for him and Robin as well. Death and Vendetta Foyle stood before the imposing Swiss chalet, its garden shrouded in the twilight. The red warning lights cast an eerie glow, and the skull and crossbones seemed to mock his presence. He knew Sergei Orel was inside, the man who had a hand in his betrayal, the man who could answer why Vorga had left him to die. He took a deep breath and stepped forward. Inside, the chalet was a labyrinth of luxury and paranoia. Foyle moved silently and found Aurel in the dimly lit living room, a glass wall separating them from the world outside. Sergei Aurel, Foyle called out. We need to talk about Vorga. Aurel turned, his face a mask of surprise and fear. Foyle, how did you get past the man traps? I'm not here to discuss security systems. I want to know why you left me on Nomad. Why did you pass me by? Boyle pressed. Aurel backed away, his hands raised. It wasn't my call, Foyle. I was just following orders. Whose orders? Foyle took a step closer. I... I can't tell you that. Aurel stammered, retreating further. You owe me that much, Aurel. You owe me my life. Foyle's voice was firm, his presence dominating. The confrontation escalated quickly. Aurel reached for a weapon, but Foyle was faster. Glass shattered around them as Foyle tackled Aurel to the ground. You're going to tell me everything, Foyle hissed, pinning Aurel beneath him. Or I swear, I'll make you wish Vorga had picked you up instead of leaving you to rot. All right, all right, I'll talk, just... Just don't kill me, Foyle, Oro, please. As Orel spilled the secrets of Vorga, Foyle listened intently. Each word was a piece of the puzzle, a step closer to understanding the betrayal that had set him on this path of vengeance. And as the truth unfolded, Foyle realized that his vendetta was more than just personal. It was a fight against a conspiracy that went deeper than he could have ever imagined. A New Dawn In the heart of the ruined cathedral, Gully Foyle stood tall, his eyes blazing with a fierce determination that matched the tiger tattoo on his skin. The crowd around him was a mosaic of faces, each one etched with anticipation and fear. They had all heard the rumors of Pyre, the substance that could unlock the future or destroy it, and now they were about to witness its power firsthand. Foyle held up a small, unassuming slug of the substance, his voice cutting through the silence like a knife. This is Pyre, he declared, and it belongs to all of us. Not just to the tiger men who think they can control our fates, but to every single one of you. A murmur rippled through the crowd as Foyle continued. For too long, secrets have been kept from us. 
Decisions made in shadowed rooms by those who claim to know better, but no more. Today we take back our right to choose, to know, and to be heard. As Foyle jaunted away, the world watched in stunned silence. From San Francisco to the far reaches of the earth, the power to decide the use of pyre was now in the hands of the people. The choice was theirs, echoing Foyle's belief in the power of choice and the right to determine one's own destiny. The Web of Power Amidst the ruins of old St. Pat's, Gully Foyle's resolve hardened. The chaos wrought by Pyre had escalated beyond mere isolated incidents to a global catastrophe, with its residues causing environmental havoc and human tragedy. As he navigated the destruction, a new voice emerged from the smoke. Dr. Linnea Morgenstern, a psychologist specializing in telepathic phenomena. She approached Foyle with an air of urgency. Mr. Foyle, I've been following your journey. Dr. Morgenstern said, her voice cutting through the chaos. Your experiences, the betrayals you've faced, they're all interconnected with the larger crisis at hand. Foyle, skeptical yet intrigued, listened as she explained her role in helping Robin Wensbury harness her telescent abilities, revealing a shocking connection to the current events. Dr. Morgenstern's insights into the psychological warfare at play offered a new perspective on the power struggles Foyle had been entangled in. As they spoke, the ground shook with another explosion, a stark reminder of the pyre's instability. We must act swiftly, Dr. Morgan Stern urged. The moon is key. It's not just a silent witness, but a pivotal location for the next phase of this struggle. There, the cultivation of anaerobic bacteria holds the potential for both destruction and salvation. Foyle's eyes narrowed, his mind racing with the implications. What do you know about the moon's involvement? He pressed Dr. Morgenstern. She hesitated, glancing around the ruins before responding. I've been told that a secret meeting is to take place on the lunar surface. One that will determine the course of human history. The players involved are willing to risk everything for control of Pyre and its potential. As she spoke, the sound of sirens grew louder and Foyle knew they had to move. The chaos was closing in. With Dr. Morgan Stern by his side, he set out to uncover the truth behind the moon's role in the unfolding crisis, driven by his determination to bring those responsible to justice. <laughs>